Thanks. Okay, got it. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, presenters, for joining us today, tonight, and businesses um, for being here, and businesses in the future who are watching the video. Um, I hope you get a lot out of this and are able to, um, you know, really I hope it benefits your business. I'm just going to do a little housekeeping and then turn it over to the people who really have something to say. Um, I'm a volunteer. I sort of came on the scene just last week. Um, Susanna Stein, I live in Woodstock. I have a background in uh, disaster recovery. Actually, I worked uh, for New York State way back after 9-11 and um, was very involved in that recovery and then got involved in the New York State floods and recovery and even with Hurricane Katrina. Since then, I have left that, but it's really great to be back in that uh, world right now. I mean, you know, as great as it can be when it's something, when it's a disaster, but um, I, I'm glad to be able to contribute. Um, we are going to, um, you have the agenda, I believe I'm gonna share it shortly. Um, we have a packed agenda, a lot of presenters. Uh, I'm gonna be pretty uh, uh, strict about timekeeping and we're gonna be done by 8.30. I don't think we're gonna have a lot of time for Q&A, but you can put all your questions in the chat and I will get to, back to the presenters to get their answers and then we'll come up with a document that summarizes all the questions and answers for everybody. And it is being recorded. So uh, there'll be a link if you need any reference to what anybody said. Um, the priority is kind of to get the the broad brush of the landscape out there, not the nitty gritty of all the details of of everything you might want to know, but the the big picture of what assistance is out there for for what needs. Um, all the contact information will be on the EDC website, and we'll have the link for that in the chat. And there'll also be a list of resources um, available on on the EDC website. So. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Clarkson for a welcome. Uh, Senator Clarkson and Tesha Bus are, and um, Beth, uh, sorry, uh, fin Finlayson. Sorry if I get your last Finlayson. Sorry, you know I am new here. Um, are sort of co-hosting, and uh, they're going to do the welcome, and then turn it over to our first presenter. Great, thank you all for taking the time to join us. You have an amazing group of some of our finest state resources, and one of the most anticipated new programs, the $20 million in state support is here with, in, represented by Joan Goldstein, who's just finished putting it together. The state, as you, I'm Allison Clarkson, I'm uh, one of your three state senators. I'm the majority leader in the Senate and serve as vice chair of Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs. And we have just met all day with, uh, in a joint meeting with House Commerce, uh, listening to the impacts on business around the state. Uh, and we heard from mayors, we heard from business owners, we heard from all the resources uh, that are, are are ready and, and able to help all of you and all of us. Uh, as we know, and it's great to see Erica and Joan and and uh, and we, you're gonna see Cam Wood later. It's, it, it, they were all terrific today. Um, we, this was a weird storm and it impacted our communities in very different ways and different from Irene. Some Irene infrastructure held up, as you know, some of it didn't. Uh, Ludlow was impacted it, it just, you know, in, in ways that they had not been in Irene. Uh, the, the notion of four feet of mud in that marketplace at the bottom of Okemo Mountain is just, it's, it's, a, it's a visual I have to hold. Um, <clears throat> 800 businesses were really hammered in this storm, 1,400 homes, that, and this is just initial counting as of, I think, yesterday. Uh, but we have a huge amount of work to do to recover and get back on our feet. And uh, the, the, the resources here are astonishing. There are federal resources, as you know, and we're the state is rowing really hard on the nonprofit and private support because as you know for business there's almost no federal grant there are no federal grants at the moment i encouraged sba today to consider moving that one year of zero interest to five years 10 years we had ppp during covid why not reintroduce ppp for this disaster recovery uh why not um have forgivable loans instead of uh, four to eight percent interest loans you're gonna hear more from SBA in a minute, but just to give you a notion in Montpelier, which as we know was so devastated, the average 
financial impact to a business in Montpelier, and this is an average, was $186,000. It's gobsmacking the damage in Montpelier. Uh, we talked about insurance issues. We talked about creating business assistance navigators to help small business. The Vermont, uh, you'll hear from Deb, the Vermont um, Small Business Development Corporation is an incredible tool for us. You're going to hear from Nicole. We have legal assistance. So there are grants now, there are loans, there is help. Uh, uh, and what we still need more of is, is some emotional and trauma support because everyone has been so impacted emotionally. So with that, I will turn to a business that has been seriously impacted and my colleague, Tesha Buss, uh, State Representative Tesha Buss. Welcome. It's good to see you, my dear. She is madly recovering. I am madly recovering and I am working too. I have a group that just checked into my place. I'm very lucky to be open after Irene. I was closed for a month. So some of our mitigation strategies did work. Um, the one success we definitely have here in Plymouth is that Route 100A didn't collapse all the way down into the intersection of 100A and Route 100. So that was a success. Um, I have an overflow property that experienced an exceptional landslide. And uh, there are a number of other uh, homes that were impacted by landslides. And that's an insurance issue because the floods don't cover landslides as we have. Flood insurance doesn't cover landslides as we we're figuring out. So we do have a lot of work to do. I'm in the trenches with you. And I really appreciate everyone here on this call. Uh, everyone's working very diligently. So thank you so very much. And I'm going to finish up and let you guys do what you do. Great. Beth, did you want to? Yeah, add anything? I just wanted to say um, thank you to all. This is an incredible group of people and resources that are here to help the Woodstock area. Um, we are so fortunate that we are not as impacted as Irene. And I just want to say to businesses, if there's something that some documentation you need copied, printed, whatever, we can act as your little mini staples at the um, chamber office to be able to um, get you what you need for um, to help with your business recovery. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Joan Goldstein from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, Vermont's agency. Good evening, everybody. I um, I didn't realize I was first. I feel uh, a little unprepared, although I've been living these details for the last week, um, and they were very dynamic, and we finally reached a conclusion last night, so just in time for our announcement, and we have our fingers crossed that we'll be able to launch next week, um, but we're coordinating a number of things. So for those of you who have not heard or um, seen the press release, we are, I mean, provided the e-board approves this on Monday, um, we'll be able to take $20 million that was appropriated elsewhere in state government and use it for a business emergency gap assistance program. The program, you know, $20 million is not a lot of money. And you would think that it would be, it could make a substantial difference. And for some, it may. But I really don't want to overwhelm this. And so I just, it's just a caution out to all the businesses that are a bit panicked about the fact that there really isn't any grant money. We're, you know, kind of well aware of that, but there is. There are other options for cash flow, like SBA loans, and we are encouraging folks to still apply for those, even if it feels like it's not feasible at the moment, at least get a commitment. You don't have to accept it. But the grants that we are giving out, we, we will be calculating, we will be asking for the entire documented damages that a business has sustained. And ask for what the expected insurance payment may be, if any, and any expected relief grants that have been received to come up with a net uncovered damage figure. And we're gonna take 20% of that figure as the grant amount, but the ceiling on that is $20,000. Yeah, so we did that so that we could get to more businesses. There are exceptions to that ceiling and the exceptions are for 
businesses that sustain damages in excess of one million dollars. If you're a business that sustains more than one million dollars, and this is physical damage, not economic injury, then your award is calculated as the lesser of 20% of the net uncovered damages or a hundred thousand dollars if they employ between if they employ 10 or less employees. The ceiling goes to $250,000 if they employ between 11 and 50 full-time equivalents. And it can go up as high as 500,000 if the employment is over 50 full-time equivalent employees. So the idea, it was, it was tough. We wanna to help as many small businesses as possible. We also wanna pay heed to the significant impacts uh, for some businesses that have millions of dollars worth of damage. And we recognize 20,000 really wouldn't go anywhere. So that is the um, kind of award award calculation process. We um, we will need some sort of documented documentary evidence. So many people have already been taking photographs. I know they've been advised by SBDC and others to take photographs of the damage. Um, if insurance has come in to do any assessments, that would be useful information. Um, any estimates for repairs or replacement of physical structure, equipment, inventory, supplies, basically all the business assets that have been impacted. And we will, um, we will ask for those as uploads so that we could assess. We, as soon as we're ready, we will commence the program. We, we have some work to do. We have to get our documents aligned for, to post on our website with details. We want to have a webinar to go through the details. We have translations to get through. So we have a number of steps, which may be better as we announce this and talk about it to give people an idea that it is coming, get, get some of the documents together so that it's not a mad scramble. It is first come first serve. I know that people have comments on that, but um, if we really want to get this money out quickly, it, it's really the only way. Otherwise we would be holding up everybody until we went through the hundreds of applications that we indeed expect since, you know, we think a conservative count is 800 um, businesses because that's what 211 has reported, but as we know, not every business has been reporting into 211, uh, despite many announcements. So please do so. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's really all I have. We, we're thinking of this as a first step. You know, we're hoping that we get a lot of information from this effort. We'll be collecting information on total damages, we'll have a little bit of an idea of net damages. And we also will collect information on economic injury, even though we're not paying on it, because we want to aggregate all of the um, damage so that if we are to petition federal government for any special pocket of money or disaster recovery, CDBG, or what have you, any, any possible avenue, at least we'll have a better sense of it. I know the governor's office has been working with the delegation in order to see if there's any any way that the federal government could help. And I know the state legislature is very interested in this as well. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of flexibility. This happened right after everything had been appropriated. Um, so we're doing the best we could with what, what funds that are available right now. Um, that's all I have, uh, unless there are questions. Great. That's so exciting. Um, we look forward to all the details and we will put information on the EDC website. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, next up is uh, speaking of the federal government, Stephen Clark from the SBA. Yes, uh, good evening. Can everybody hear me? All right, well, I will uh, begin. I am Stephen Clark. I work for the Office of Disaster Recovery and Resilience of the U.S. Small Business Administration. So we are the portion of the SBA that travels to uh, disaster locations and works on our disaster loan programs. There are two primary disaster loan programs. I will focus on 
the, I guess, kind of more immediate program are physical damage disaster loans. Um, these are available for homeowners and renters, as well as private nonprofits and for businesses of all sizes. The physical damage disaster loan application deadline is September 12th, 2023. So we do not want anyone to miss that deadline, which is coming up. Um, we encourage everyone uh, to apply for an SBA disaster loan before they receive an insurance settlement. Our rules allow the borrowers to borrow up to the amounts of our loan limits for their damage before receiving insurance funds. And then the rules state that they are required to use their insurance settlement to pay down or pay off the SBA loan. We do not want anyone to be in a situation where say sometime in the fall after the physical damage application deadline, they receive less money than they thought they would from their insurance and then say, well, I've got this shortfall to repair or rebuild what can I do in terms of resources? The resources, at least in terms of the physical damage disaster loans, are set up in a way that we want to immediately uh, help people apply, send out a damage verifier, and help move them along in the process of receiving both SBA aid and aid from any other uh, government agencies, such as the state um, or private charity, um, other philanthropic groups, things like that. I know there have been a number of donations in various communities uh, to try to help some folks out. Um, but some basics about our physical damage disaster loan programs. For homeowners, uh, the current loan limit is $200,000 for physical damage to real estate. Um, you can use this money to repair, rebuild, or relocate. Uh, for homeowners and renters, we have an additional $40,000 for personal property. So whether this is your furniture, appliances, electronics, or it could be uh, motor vehicles. I know many of them were damaged in the storms and flooding. On the business side for physical damage loans, the statutory uh, loan limit is $2 million. Um, and uh, uh, businesses and private nonprofits can apply for that amount for their uh, physical damage. Funds can be used to relocate businesses. The idea is this type of SBA loan is not for business expansion, but if you need to move to a different facility because you can't you know, repair your current location and you need to get operating soon, you can do those kind of things. So you're not tied to one specific location. Uh, we certainly encourage all of the homeowners and renters to apply for FEMA assistance as well. Uh, there are uh, rules about the FEMA grant programs, and some of the FEMA grants depend on the outcome of an SBA disaster loan application. So if you, after FEMA refers you to the SBA, if you don't apply for an SBA loan, you may not receive additional FEMA assistance. I know that for homeowners and renters who are not able to receive an SBA physical damage disaster loan because of lack of ability to repay the SBA loan. Those individuals are sent to FEMA to receive the maximum amounts FEMA can provide in terms of their grant money. Um, the, I, I guess I should now discuss briefly the other disaster loan program we have available, which is the economic injury disaster loans. So these are working capital loans for private nonprofits and businesses that have suffered an economic injury that is a loss of revenue. There is no requirement that the nonprofit or business had any physical damage. I know that there are a number of businesses who were closed for several weeks, and that might be their biggest issue, not that they had any physical damage. The application deadline for these loans is nine months after the or excuse me, nine months after the declaration for the disaster. So that's April 15th, 2024. So the businesses and nonprofits for economic injury have more time to determine if they have had this loss and if they need to apply for the loan. I guess I should backtrack slightly and say that one of the reasons why the physical damage uh, deadline, why I highlighted that is the SBA and FEMA have a number of centers around the state where we have FEMA representatives and we have trained, experienced SBA customer service representatives. 
you can go to these places in person and they will help you apply. So, you know, they can perhaps your computer uh, at home is damaged or destroyed or inaccessible. Uh, they can help you with that. And the SBA representatives can also help you uh, reconstruct records and things of that nature and guide you through the application process with what you have available, uh, given perhaps you may have a fair amount of physical damage uh, that you, you know, your business records may be there or perhaps your information about your home. So we have uh, currently three business recovery centers uh, across the state. And uh, I believe there are number four, there are four more FEMA disaster recovery centers available. And I believe another one will be opening soon. Uh, I'll have more information about that, and I can share documents or links to uh, those locations. Most importantly, there is a location in downtown Ludlow at the Engel and Volkers Okima uh, building at 126 Main Street, which is currently open uh, Monday through Sunday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, where people can apply. Um, so uh, that's about the basics of what the SBA has to offer. Um, I guess that's a little faster than the 10 minutes, but I could answer questions or just take the time at the end. Could you just talk about the interest and the first year and stuff so people... Oh, yes. I guess there are five more five more points I should highlight then. Yeah. And also, if you accept grants, how that may affect your interest rate. Okay. Um, so for the home loans, uh, for homeowners and renters, the rate can be as low as 2.5%. Um, there is the, the SBA will make a determination if credit is available elsewhere, the rate could be as high as 5%. Uh, for the business loans, the rate could be as low as 4%. The credit available elsewhere rate is 8%. Uh, for nonprofits, for the physical damage loans, the, the rate is a flat 2.375%. For the economic injury loans, uh, they're only available if no credit is available elsewhere in the regulatory determination of the SBA, the business rate is 4%, the nonprofit rate is 2.375%. I guess, and yes, thank you for pointing out, I usually highlight five big points about the SBA loans. One, there is no application fee. Two, there is no obligation to accept the loan, and you have at least 60 days from when you're approved until you have to make a decision and you can ask for more time. Three, during the term of the loan, which can be up to 30 years, there is no prepayment penalty. So if you then receive your insurance settlement a month later or a year later, and uh, you, you can use those funds to repay the loan as you're required to do, and there's no prepayment penalty for that. Uh, fourth, there is no accrued interest during the first year of the loan. And fifth, there is no required payments during the first year of the loan. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've been talking about um, assistance that is available to businesses directly. Uh, we're gonna move to the section on financial support for employees, which I, I know is a concern. Um, and first we're gonna hear from Cameron Wood from the Vermont Department of Labor. Susanna, can I just interject yes. simply? We weren't able to get Sue Minter or Patty Conline to come and talk to us about, about the Vermont Main Street Flood Recovery Fund. But I just want to say that that is active and engaged. Businesses are able to apply now. Uh, they have raised almost $500,000 in support. Uh, they are being funded. Uh, some of the business funding from the Vermont Community Foundation is going to this uh, to this fund. And um, you can apply, I think it's on your website, but it's vermontrecovery2023.com and they're giving out grants now. Uh, and so uh, it's being, so I just wanted to give that update even though we don't have somebody to speak to it. Right, thank you. And there's their website, but again, it will be in the contact sheet that we have tomorrow. Um, okay, Cameron from DOL, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Cameron Wood. I'm the policy and legislative director for the Vermont Department of Labor. And I also serve as the director of the Unemployment Insurance Division for the department. I just want to thank Susanna, Senator Clarkson, for asking for the department to come speak 
uh, at this forum and, and we're happy to be here because I'll do my best to be succinct, but the, the thing I want individuals to take away from the department and the, the message that we're trying our best to get out is that if individuals have had their employment impacted due to the disaster, so if you have lost wages, you have lost hours, it doesn't even have to be a complete loss of employment, even if your hours have been reduced or you've had to reduce the hours for your employees, those individuals, uh, including yourselves as business owners, are likely eligible for wage benefits, unemployment benefits from the Department of Labor. So the message that we're trying to make sure we're getting out is you do not need to wait for um, disaster unemployment. We've seen that as being a little bit of a, a misunderstanding from the public. They're thinking my employment was due to my unemployment or, or my employees who I can't you know, keep on, they're unemployed due to the disaster. Therefore, we need to wait for disaster unemployment. That's not always the case. And so we're trying to get the message out that uh, if, if you or your employees are unemployed or have a reduction in, in income due to loss of employment, you can file for unemployment now. And for most of employees, most of the individuals who work for businesses, they're most likely going to be eligible for regular unemployment insurance, and they do not need disaster unemployment. What disaster unemployment assistance is for are for those individuals who will not be eligible for regular unemployment insurance. So for all of your employees, they're likely going to be eligible for regular UI. But keep in mind for yourselves, if you're a business owner, self-employed individual, independent contractor, if you have lost income because it's directly related to the disaster, you may not be eligible for regular UI, but you're most likely eligible for disaster unemployment assistance. And this is something that uh, is provided through FEMA and the U.S. Department of Labor. It's administered by the Vermont Department of Labor, and we have already applied for with USDOL to receive funding to be able to support this program. And I can already say that as of um, Tuesday, we've already had 40 individuals who we've identified as potentially eligible for DUA because they were ineligible for regular unemployment. And we've already reached out to those individuals, had them file their initial claim for disaster unemployment assistance, and we're gonna be moving them through that program. So the way this works, um, we're asking everyone, you, you have to file a regular claim for UI. So go ahead, call the department's initial claims line. We also have put our initial claims on our website. So you can file that initial claim electronically if you choose to do so. Uh, there is some identity proofing on the front end of our application to try to prevent stolen identities and fraudsters. So you can file online or you can call our claim center. You can file your initial claim. And then we as a department on the back end, we can determine, okay, you're an employee, you're eligible for UI, we move you into the UI program. You're a self-employed individual, you may not be eligible for unemployment, okay, you may be eligible for DUA, we reach out to you, we have our staff contact you and fill out the claim for disaster unemployment assistance. So uh, I, I wanna highlight that you know the DUA piece is for people who are not eligible for UI, that includes self-employed, but if you are unable to reach your place of employment because the location in which you conduct your work, your business, it's closed down, you're eligible for DUA. If you were uh, scheduled to start a job and that is no longer available to you because of the disaster, you're eligible for DUA. Um, if you have been injured because of the disaster and you cannot work, you are eligible for DUA. Uh, if you are a business owner and you have had a significant loss of income because of the disaster, you can't get to the location or, um, you know, you work in the community and it's no longer available to you because of the flooding or because of uh, all the debris, et cetera. I mean, these are reasons that you may be eligible to receive income replacement. And the key is 
Um, you just you have to file uh, and, and we will determine your eligibility and, and reach out to you and make sure you're in the right program. I want to highlight a few things for the employers who you are listening or, or maybe following the recording afterwards. Uh, there may be some concern about impacts to uh, unemployment rates. And one thing we spoke to Senator Clarkson and her committee and the House Commerce Committee earlier today, we spoke about this. If your employees are filing for unemployment and they're eligible for regular unemployment, yes, that will be charged back to you or it could be charged back to your experience rating. However, the department has the ability to waive up to four weeks of benefit charges due to the disaster. That's already on the books and we don't need any statutory language and we will be reviewing and pursuing that. So, you know, if your employees need support, please have them reach out to us because we will have the ability to waive those benefit charges at a future date. And we've already spoken with Senator Clarkson's committee and the House Commerce about whether or not we need to expand that beyond the four weeks, depending on the impact of, of the, the layoffs associated with this event. So uh, just know that we will have the ability to, to relieve charges uh, because of this. If you as an individual need to file and you're eligible for disaster unemployment assistance, those are paid for from FEMA dollars. And so those will not be charged back to you at all, uh, and they will not impact any unemployment insurance contributions in the future. Uh, and those are wages that, uh, you know, you, you have the right to if you've lost employment because of this. And so we want to make sure everybody understands uh, that, that they can file and, and this is eligible for them. Um, I do want to highlight, as was mentioned by you know, my, the, the previous speakers, there are some tight deadlines as it relates to filing for benefits. Um, your, your employees can generally file whenever they, whenever they choose if they have lost income or, or lost employment. But for DUA in particular, so, so for the, the self-employed, for business owners, et cetera, you have to file within 30 days from the date the department announced the program. And this is a FEMA deadline, a FEMA requirement. So we announced for the initial six counties that were approved for individual assistance, uh, which includes your county. Um, we announced that last week. And so the current deadline to file is by August 21st. 2023. So you have until August 21st to file, and please know that we can backdate your claim. We can backdate the DUA benefits all the way back to the beginning of the flooding uh, the week of July 15th. So, so we can go back in time, but we do need people to get their applications in uh, before that deadline of August 21st. We're looking to try to extend the deadline but as of right now, August 21st, uh, DUA will allow for up to 27 weeks of wage replacement support for people that remain eligible for the program. So uh, starting the week, July 15th, you may be eligible for benefits all the way up to the week of January 13th, 2024. So I really appreciate you guys, uh, you know, allowing me to join. And, and again, Susanna, Senator Clarkson, thank you. Uh, the big thing we want to get out there for you and your employees, there is income wage replacement support through the UI program, and you just have to start by filing that initial claim. And then we figure out where your employees and where you go from there. So uh, I'll be listening in for the rest of the session and happy to take any questions in the chat or afterwards. Thank you all. Great. Thank you so much. That's helpful. Um, we're going to move on to John Spector talking about Woodstock EDC. Thanks, Susanna. And uh, the, um, the I, if I could actually, um, where did the, if, if I could just ask Cameron a quick question, um, because the EDC's initiatives were partly in a small way influenced by what we understood the Labor Department to be doing. How long does it take, Cameron, if a person uh, contacts you, is not 
eligible for UI, but is eligible for DUA, how quickly do they get switched into the processing of the DUA? Yeah, yeah, great question. I also see another question in the chat that I will respond to about the different deadlines for the counties. I'll respond to that. Um, what we've tried to do as a department is we asked, we began to ask the question on the initial claim, is your separation due to the flooding and the disaster in July of 2023? We also asked whether or not you're self-employed. So when that initial claims comes in, we can immediately, after it's processed, it takes us usually a, a day or two to process it through our mainframe. But after a two-day period, we can already identify those people that say that they're self-employed and say that their separation is due to the disaster. And at that point, if we determine that you're not monetarily eligible, we can immediately switch you over and have staff review your claim for uh, DUA. It took us a little over a week to get the claims process ready to go, but uh, we only started taking DUA claims this week. And we've already, uh, like I said, we've already identified 40 people, moved them over and, and reached out to them. So if you're a self-employed person, we should be able to do it within a matter of days. And what if you're an employee of a local business? what's the time frame? Do they also, they also have to go through UI, get rejected and then moved over. Is that the same time frame for them? Uh, keep in mind, a lot of your employees are likely going to be eligible for regular unemployment. The only reason we would move them over to DUA is if they were somehow not able to work uh, or available to work, but we're also relaxing those requirements right now to make sure that people get benefits as quickly as possible. So, um, assuming that there, there are no unique circumstances, uh, it, it should be a matter of days before their claim is through and processed, and then they're able to file their weekly claims. Uh, we have taken some of our staff uh, off of some of their other duties, moved them into the UI claims processing, so we can try to get these people identified, moved into the right program as quickly as possible. And um, John and, and Susanna, if you'll indulge me for just a quick moment, one other key piece of information I assume uh, would be very valuable for you all on the call. Your, your business may be closed and your employees are filing for unemployment, but you're hoping to get back to operations within you know, two months. Uh, if, if, you, if your employees notify us of a return to work date that's within 10 weeks, we can waive their work search requirements so they do not have to go out and look for work while you're trying to rebuild and bring them back. Um, if your employees do not provide us with a return to work date, you all as the employer can go in and update the return to work date through the employer portal. I'll also provide an email address to Susanna and, and I'll try to put it in the chat where you can email us to provide us with a return to work date Again, if it's within a 10 week period, we're being very reasonable. You know, don't feel like you need to be spot on with the date. Put it out as far as you feel that you need to to, to bring your people back. But if, if we have that return to work date, they will not be required to look for work because uh, we really want to make sure we're supporting businesses as they try to come back online. John, I hope I hope I've answered your question. You have directly. And the reason I ask that is because the program I'm about to explain at EDC was in very small part. Uh, it might have been influenced by concerns on the part of some local businesses that the, the regular that the entire unemployment insurance process in either category was so difficult that it and so time consuming that it would, uh, you know, not be feasible for many people. And um, anyway, uh, we will definitely pass on the the response that you just gave. I think that's going to uh, really help uh, help individuals to understand what resources are available to them. Thank you. Um, yes, the, econ the Economic Development, I'll be very brief, the Economic Development Commission has held a series of special and in one case emergency meetings. Um, and on Tuesday morning at 930, we are presenting our recommendation to the select board. We have, we have voted to uh, allocate $45,000, which is essentially all of our remaining funds for 2023 to a uh, work to an employee uh, wage support program. Um, any business, any employee of a business based in Woodstock that has lost more than 12 hours of 
work or will lose more than 12 hours of work because we have a couple of businesses that fit into Cameron's category of being closed for multiple weeks or a couple of months in some cases. Uh, anyone who loses 12 or more hours of work can apply for a grant of, uh, and, uh, of $250. Anyone who has lost 20 hours or more can apply for a grant of $500. We've allocated $400,000, uh, sorry, $45,000 to this program. That means uh, that we could give up to 90 grants of $500 or more than that for people who have worked uh, slightly fewer hours. Uh, and uh, we will prioritize those who have worked more than 20 hours to the extent that funds are available. So we can't guarantee that everyone who applies will get those amounts because we only have $45,000. Uh, and these grants, I believe we will open the application process as soon as the select board approves this, assuming that they do uh, next Tuesday morning. Um, we will take grant applications for one week. Um, we will then start writing checks. So the checks should be available within about two weeks from, from tomorrow. Um, and they can be picked up if you don't want them to get stuck in the mail at town hall, or you can be mailed to you. And if there are funds available after that first round, we will continue to accept applications until we run out of funds. And I think I'll, uh, Larry, is there anything else that I've left out? It's, it's 2.30 in the morning where I am, so I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> Uh, that's John, the, can you just re-emphasize re who's eligible? Yeah, any employee who works for a Woodstock-based company, whether they reside or do not reside in Woodstock, we're, we're, the focus here is to try to prevent, is to protect the employees of local Woodstock-based businesses, and protect them both from, you know, from suffering economic damage and also from leaving the Woodstock workforce. Both of those obviously are very important. Is that what you wanted, Joe? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. That's the uh, EDC's program. Go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah, that's very exciting. Um, oh, uh, and now, Jill, uh, it turns out that you're up next. Okay, and I'm going to share some slides. Great. Is that good? Uh, so I'm Jill Davis. I'm one of the volunteers of working with The Hub. The Hub is an initiative to help families and individuals who live in the Woodstock area in a crisis. We've just built The Hub as a permanent um, organization. Uh, we didn't realize we were going to have to staff up so quickly to an emergency, but that's what we've been doing the past few weeks. Um, it's a project of the Woodstock Community Trust, so it is a Woodstock Community Trust is a 501c3. What we do is we're a portal so that people who have an emergency come to us and then we can access different funding sources and help people get to um, different providers. So an applicant who needs help learns about the hub, completes the online application. They become attached to a case worker who really a case advocate who connects them to the needed sources. So the resources may be money to pay bills. We never give individuals money, we pay their bills, whether it be an electricity bill or a car payment. Um, we would um, connect them to any emotional support they need or any other services that already exist in the community that they might not be using like the food shelves. We are now working with people who need help recovering from the flooding. That can be employees who live in Barnard, Bridgewater, Killington, Plymouth, Pomfret, Reading, or, and Woodstock. Um, and we, the people that we're working with to provide the funding are all the different uh, neighborhood organizations, Barnard Helping Hands, Bridgewater Neighbors, Helping Neighbors, King's Daughters, Articucci Health Foundation, Pivotal Steps, Plymouth Memory Tree, Woodstock Faulkner Fund and various faith organizations. And then we're also connecting with larger groups like the Haven. And as I say, we can also connect people with um, larger state organizations. So if anybody wants help filling in their FEMA application, we can do that. We can help people access the unemployment or the different resources that, that you've heard here. 
We're not helping businesses, we're helping employees of businesses who live in our towns. And so here are the different numbers and uh, addresses to for an individual to complete their application. We already have 62 applicants, um, but we're raising money so that we have money to help people through this period until they get on the, to the different state resources. Great, thank you very much. Um, that'll be on the website. All, the, all these links will be on the website tomorrow. Um, we're going to move on to the topic of general support. And first up is Nicole Killeran talking about legal assistance from the Vermont Law School. Hi, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, I, I run the Entrepreneurial Legal Laboratory at Vermont Law and Graduate School. Our, we like to say that we provide access to legal services for small businesses. Uh, what we do is uh, primarily education. That's what, that's what our model is. But we also have a paid referral system. So we are able to speak with folks to help them understand the law, the legal questions that they're navigating. We're also able to find an attorney, connect the business owner to the attorney, and then pay for the attorney to provide services to the business up to 10 hours of services. So that's what we do to respond to the flood. Uh, what we have done is created a expedited way that folks can request services. I'm going to put that in the chat here. Anybody, any business owner who wants to access these services, feel free to go to this form, fill it out. It comes to me. I process it very quickly and I will schedule either a short phone call with business owner to do an educational conversation and help them understand what they're what they're uh, maneuvering around and help them help try to answer some questions. I'll get them ready to work with an attorney and then I can get them onto an attorney pretty quickly. So we have an excellent partnership with the Vermont Bar Association that allows us to do to do this. It's a wonderful partnership um, and we've been able to find folks attorneys relatively quickly already. I've had a few requests come in. So um, one other thing I want to mention is that I, I am going to be traveling around the state with my team to do um, to just show up in, in the communities that have, been, that have been hardest hit and be available for questions about legal issues. So I am going to be doing one of these tomorrow in Montpelier. Uh, I would like to visit the towns that have been impacted and be available to the businesses. So I would be, uh, I'll, I'm not going to do it now, of course, but I'll reach out to the folks for Woodstock and see if I can coordinate a, coordinate a time and place where I can just be available for folks to ask questions if they have them. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, I will uh, yield the balance of my time. Great, thank you very much. Some great resources here. Um, next up is the Vermont Small Business Development Center with Deborah Bourdreau, Bourdreau sorry, and Scott Holson. Good evening and thank you very much. Scott and I are both really pleased to be here. Um, and Nicole knows me, so she yielded her time because she knows that I'll probably talk too long. <laughs> um, we have a lot to say, so I'll go as quickly as I can. The reason you have two of us tonight for the price of one is that I am the disaster recovery specialist on the team and Scott is actually your local area advisor. So they let me talk first. Um, Vermont Small Business Development Centers, if you don't know what we do, we're, we were here before the flood, we'll be here all the time that it's going, unfortunately, and we'll be here after. And we are, we, we provide one-on-one, -on -one, confidential, really important word there, and no fee business advising into small business. Um, we're experienced in disaster recovery because of Irene. Um, the, we have several resources. Scott's going to pop them into the chat as we go so that you guys can pick them up for the, you know, your thing that you're handing out tomorrow. The confidential part means very, very importantly that we're on your team. There's a lot of there's a lot of information coming at you. And it's really hard, as we know, for business owners, especially with the trauma of what has happened and and and. And, and on the heels of the, you know, two years of the, you know, pandemic trauma, to know that you have somebody who you can go in and say anything and explore any option you want. So when you're with us, what we're asking you to do always is to pause, consider, and prepare. And the reason we're going to say pause to you a lot is after Irene, when I went out and spoke to my clients, and then I got the chance to speak nationally some, and I talked to businesses around the country and in, in Vermont, 
and ask them what was the thing that you wished you'd done the most post disaster, they all said resoundingly, we wished we'd paused more. We wished we'd taken a breath and listened to you and paused. So in the pause, there's a lot of things that you can do and there's a lot of clarity. The first thing we'd like you to do is go pick up the disaster recovery guide. We created it after Irene because there was not anything nationally amongst the SBDCs. It's a national program that had a recovery guide. There were a lot of disaster preparedness guides, but there were no recovery guides. So we put all of the steps together that we brought our clients through after Irene, and that is now in a booklet. Those booklets are in hard copy. They're at the business recovery centers. Um, they're also, there's online, Scott's already put in the link to that. You can use it by yourself. We really suggest that you use it with one of us or another one of your trusted business advisors. And there's a lot of people out. I see Erica's gonna speak after me. There's a lot of people here who who you also could speak to confidentially um, to just look at all of the things. It pulls in all of the steps and helps you make a, de a decision about how you're going to go forward and when you're going to go forward. Are you going to, disasters have a way of giving businesses an opportunity to look at where their business was before the disaster, where it is now, what would they like it to be? Do they want to reopen in the same way? Do they want to reopen in the same place? Do they want to reopen differently? Do they want to completely change what they were doing and not do it at all? And that's why we say we're on your team. No judgment about what it is that you choose to do. We saw businesses after Irene come in too soon onto streets that they were the only person open. Um, so, you know, when's the best timing? All of those things are in this pause, consider and prepare and completely laid out in the guide. In addition to that, we have a resource page on our website, Flood 2023. We do an email when we have we did them. If any of you were on our list during COVID, you know that we did these a lot. They're a step-by-step -step set of verified, actionable steps that the business owners can do. We look at what's available to them on the state level and on the federal level, and we and we give very clear instructions. And they're broken down. They're very clear. We put them to other resources. But a lot of people felt very good when those came into their mailbox. And when we we have done some emails, but we're going to start the updates next week. And I'll tell you why we're waiting. Um, and one after the other, every new one comes out and the new things are highlighted. So you don't have to read. There's an index on the website. It, it, we essentially... It, feel like it's our job to review all of this myriad of material and try to um, analyze it and make it into actionable steps. So that's coming up. If you're not on that list, please let Scott or myself know. We're going to give you our emails and we'll add you to that. The other thing we are is we're trained and we're going to get a new training next week on the idol. Um, we're not we're not the specialists that you're going to deal with. Again, we're the people that you talk to about whether debt is the, the right um, thing for you to access, what you need to be fully prepared to do the application. Um, we go through all of that material with you. The SBA has been, you know, we're partners with them. Um, they've been very, very helpful in getting us the really granular detail that we can know all of it so that we can help our clients, again, do that pause step and consider. It's a simple beginning of the application, but the resultant materials that the loan officer asks for are somewhat more complex, and we want people to understand the breadth of what they're going to be asked for. So again, they can make that decision. And then we say, if you Go ahead and do the application and you get it. You get the offer. That's the other thing we try to help people understand in typical commercial lending. You're walking into a bank and saying, I want X amount of dollars. I want $100,000 to do this project. And the bank reviews your business plan and your request. And they say yes or no. 
with a disaster loan, you're going in and you're saying, here's my here's my damage, here's my economic injury, and then an offer is made for an amount. And, and so you don't really know what the amount is going to be or the interest rate or the term until the loan officer gets in touch with you. And then you have to, as Stephen has already said, if you've gotten an insurance settlement, you're required by law to use that to pay. Other grants um, and things that you get are also taken into consideration at that point. And we say at that point, before you sign the loan papers, talk to us again. Let's just make sure at that point that this is something you want to do because debt is debt. And as far as we're hearing, um, and we know that lots of people, and thank you, Senator Clarkson, for asking this question or asking if any of this is potentially forgivable. And what we're hearing is no at this point. Um, so we want you to consider that before you, before you sign. Um, so that's what we do. We're also here to help you just remind you that there are an enormous number of scammers out there. Please be very, very careful. Um, I've worked with the SBA um, disaster team. Um, I've spoken with them nationally, as I said, and I've, and I've been with them in Irene. I swear to God, I'm not kidding. Stephen might say I'm wrong about this, but they sleep in their SBA identification badges. I don't think they ever take them off. I think they're waterproof. If the person who comes up to you does not have a FEMA badge or an SBA badge and they can't verify themselves and they can't give you a number to call to, you know, don't talk to them because they're out there in force. Um, FEMA knows it, SBA knows it, we all know it. Just be really careful. It's a hard time not to accept help. Um, Vermonters are, thank goodness, fairly um, conservative about who they'll talk to, but I think just be really careful. And we really suggest that if you can get to one of the business recovery centers, you get there because the staff there um, is fully trained. They're great people. This is what they do all the time. Um, they get deployed like the military and they go to different places all the time. You're going to meet really interesting people from around the country and they're trained to help and they're the real deal. So be careful about that. So again, I'm here to answer major questions um, and to support our team in the disaster recovery process. I also have my own area. I cover Wyndham and Southern Windsor counties. Um, but Scott is ready to step in and help any business individually. So please please use these services. And once you become a client of SBDC, you are a client forever. I've been doing this 13 years now, and I have clients that I met in my first year that st I still see. So please know we're, we're really here, we're committed, and, and we're sorry. <laughs> we're really <laughs> sorry this is happening to our businesses. So yeah. thank you very much. Great, thank you. Right, it all comes down to that. We don't really want to be here, but glad that we are all. Are all. Um, last but not least is Erica hoffman Keese from Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation. Hi, I'm going last is actually really easy because uh, I am kind of the boots on the ground that helps businesses find all of you. We work very closely with SBDC and Scott Holson is actually our regional counselor for Orange County and Northern Windsor County, the region, the service area that, that Green Mountain um, serves. Uh, we, there are a couple of things that I do wanna call out specifically um, from the Regional Development Corporation. We're one of 12 regional development corporations that, walk, that work across the state. And uh, currently, my counterpart in central Vermont, Melissa Bounty, has uh, pulled together resources, a lot of them represented here, Vermont Law and Grad School, SBDC, the Department of Labor, um, for what's, what's being called the Business Support Center. This is different than the Business Resource Center. This is um, a site at the Central Vermont Chamber of Commerce, as though we could make it more confusing. It's at the Central Vermont Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> and um, Folks are cycling through there to give specific advice. There are accountants, there are counselors, there are lawyers. Um, SBDC, I know, has people cycling through there uh, and uh, DOL. 
uh, that's something that um, is available to anyone who can get there. It's it's located in Berlin, but it's open to anyone who can get there. They also are doing a great job with some uh, a, a piece of work that got overlooked, I think, initially, which is um, translation services. So they, they have a lot of translators available to help um, for business owners that or employees that might not speak English as their first language. So the regional development corporations, like I said, we work across the state. There are 12 of us. We each have our own service area. Um, generally, I think of myself as a matchmaker between the people that come to me with needs and the resources that I know about. Um, a couple of other terms that I've had thrown at me recently, just within the last couple of weeks, are handholding, which during a time like this is a valuable, valuable skill and um, a shoulder to lean on. Someone said that to me today. I was in Chelsea uh, speaking with some folks um, in the village there that had been affected. So um, our list of uh, activities that we engage in and services that we provide is lengthy, but generally you can matchmaking right up there at the top. Uh, there's we're another door that you can open that will get you to where you need to go. And um, we are currently looking at the opportunity to perhaps house uh, a flood relief I think they were called flood relief officers or flood recovery officers after Irene. That's something that will happen down the line if it does. Um, but those would be focused in the uh, most uh, hard hit areas. I see Deborah has her hand up. I'd like to add one more thing, Erica, if you don't mind. Um, uh, not at all. We love you... working with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> We do this all the time. RDCs and SBDCs just interrupt each other all the time. It's part of what we do. Um, uh, what I didn't say is that one of the things that we do in the in the disaster recovery guide really talks about a lot is document, document, document. Stephen has said document. Um, Nicole's shaking her head. Yes. And not only document with photographs and narrative, the physical damage, but begin to document your the the economic impact. Um, if you wake up tomorrow morning, I mean, I talked to a client yesterday who had done a very smart pivot during COVID to being online. Um, they have a they have an outside issue that's now affecting that. They had changed their focus at the beginning of the summer to more wholesale and more local again. And then this hit and already eight of their wholesalers are not open now and may not open quickly. I said, document all of that, write their names down the day they called and said they weren't going to open or the day you made your outreach to them because you think you're going to remember this. And I can guarantee you, you won't. There will be a point next week or six weeks from now or eight weeks from now where this is all going to feel like a blur. So buy yourself a little notebook, get a special section on your phone for notes, every single thing that impacts your business, a you know, it doesn't have to be a complete sentence, just the date and what happened. Um, it helps build your case for grants in the future. It helps build your case for economic injury later on with the with the SBA, if that's what you're considering. So just document. Document when you call your insurance company. Um, Tesh has had this already and they say no the first time. What what day did you make that call? Who did you spoke to speak to? What did they say? When did you make the second call? Because I'm going to tell you to call again. Um, when did you make the third call? I'm going to tell you to call again. And then when did you call Bishka? And when did you let the, you know, when, who, and then who else did you let know? So if you want to make different pages for different activities, you can. If not, just write it out like you're keeping a journal and, and keep that handy so that you can do it. It's a really important piece. So thank you for letting me speak again. Yeah, it actually reminds me of something um, that, uh, that I am doing at GMBDC and I know several of my counterparts are with uh, being able to take a step back from we're not, you know, first responders, we're not on the ground shoveling out mud um, is asking questions about the impact of biz to businesses that help us 
to understand the impact on the regional economy. Um, I was talking to a farmer today. He's lost 50% of his vegetable crop. Um, you know, fields are destroyed. And then we started talking about a CSA program. And he shared that a couple of his CSA clients were a local nursing home and a local child care facility. So this is going to be a trickle down effect on those facilities, which actually were the nursing home was affected, but the child care center was not flood affected. But this is going to affect their bottom line because they're now have, going to have to buy in food that they were expecting to have from this farm. So one of the, the kind of sidelines of, of when I'm out talking to people right now is asking those questions to help determine and be able to feed back to folks like Joan and um, the SBA and the legislature what kind of impacts we're going to be seeing down the road from what's happening now with our businesses. Um, so that's, I didn't, I don't really have a lot of specific details to offer to you because we don't offer a lot of programs of, of our own at GMBDC right now. We don't have a revolving loan fund that's out there. Um, we have a small disaster revolving loan fund that is available on our website. I can give you, it's gmbdc.com. Um, but that is, that's a insignificant amount of money when we're looking at some of the damage that I've seen. Um, but uh, the value in what we bring today is our connections and the network that we have. If we don't have the expertise that we need in our region, I have 11 other people around the state, many of whom are dealing with exactly the same issues and um, expertise and contacts and networks that I can tap for questions that come our way or concerns or specific challenges. Right, thank you so much. Um, we do have a time for a couple of questions. If, if any of the business owners on the call wanna get a word in edgewise, um, any questions or anything? Okay, well, that was a lot of information, a lot, a lot of links in the chat. Um, oh, Erica has something else, yes. I, I have a question. I didn't want to jump in front of business people, but Stephen, could you, uh, Clark, could you confirm the locations of the resource centers? You said, I thought I heard you say four, and I only know about the locations of three of them right now. Okay, they're, they're currently... And the, I posted the link in the chat. There, oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I can look at that. There, you don't need to apologize. There are three business recovery centers. These are run by the SBA. There's one in Morrisville, one in Berlin, and one in Ludlow. Okay, great. In addition, there are SBA representatives at the FEMA disaster recovery centers in Rutland, Barrie, Waterbury, and Londonderry. And you're also at our multi-agency resource centers, which are kind of like pop-up resource centers. We had one here in Woodstock at our high school, which was incredible. And just sadly, not enough people took advantage of it, but it was, we had everybody there, which was terrific. The, and the only group that weren't there were the SBA. Everybody else was there, but we needed SBA. So the next one we do, we're going to hope that SBA would be, would be. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know about that. Um, I would have gone. Uh, so oh, we would have I'm loved sorry to that, that we missed we missed uh, making the connection on that. But I am available. Um, right. This county is supposedly where I'm going to be uh, focusing my primary efforts to do outreach. So, any events you have where you would like an SBA presentation, I'm your guy. <laughs> Good to know. So there's so many resources and oh Beth, do you have something to add? I just wanted to say to Stephen. He kind of came in today and used a desk at the Chamber Welcome Center, and that's available to you at any time. You know, we have Wi-Fi, and if that's a good location, feel free to publicize it and feel free to use it at any time. And, and I would just say to Nicole, that you know that your chambers or your partners, as you do that tour, your chambers can lead you to the most impacted businesses. And, and uh, you know, something we haven't talked 
enough maybe about and and I there's a lot of trauma maybe not in Woodstock but there is a lot of emotional uh oh uh, there's just the emotional impact is huge would one of you um uh, at these at the mark at the multi-agency resource center in Woodstock we had the Red Cross and they have a whole emotional support unit uh but they aren't here forever. Um, can you just, can somebody just address the, I know the hub, ah, Jill, you have the emotional. So yes. would, would you just expand on that? Because that is, that's a big need. So as soon as an applicant applies to us, we, the case advocate works out what the needs are. And if those needs are financial, then we relieve, we're stress relievers. We pay a bill that relieves stress, that helps the emotions. But if they re if they need emotional support, then we have the connections and the funds to make that happen. So, so John John is putting together uh, updating the website with all of these links and resources and basically everything that everybody has said, um, and that's going to. He can actually share share a screen now and show you a glimpse of what it's going to be like when it's completed, uh, and it'll be hopefully complete tomorrow. Although it's probably going to be ever changing, and new resources will become available. So that's a glimpse of what there will be. Um, so that is the conclusion of our program. Um, we appreciate so much everybody's time and energy and funds and enthusiasm. Um, yeah, I can't thank Susan, you enough really for joining us. John, yes. Could I just make a quick comment because this is your first version of this, Susanna, and thank you, by the way, you've done a fantastic job of assembling. Oh, here, here. But I, unfortunately, all of the presenters on this webcast are getting very good at this. This is not the first time that the Woodstock EDC and the Chamber have sponsored these kinds of webcasts. And this one tonight was as concise and focused as any that I've seen before. Uh, if not more so. And so in the next couple of days, we're going to get this video recording up on the website. Uh, we may, if we can, break it down into specific segments so that people can go directly to the pieces that are most relevant to them. We will get all of the links. Um, Susanna is going to coordinate via email any other um, contact, any other contacts, email contacts where you're willing to give them and links and so forth. And Susanna, I assume you're going to reach out to people to, to mm -hmm. do that. So please get that to her. And as soon as she has it, we'll, we'll get it posted on the website. I just wanted to add that. So thank you everybody on behalf of There's the EDC. A question. I think Cameron Cam has something too. Yeah. Uh, not a question. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback a little bit off what Senator Clarkson mentioned and, and Jill were talking about, just because I think this is really important and, and, and may not be uh, easily connected or intuitive or thought about um, regarding individuals who may be going through emotional trauma. If you are ineligible to work, your business owner, you've lost your business, your house circumstances, you're ineligible to work because of, you know, uh, anxiety or whatever the emotional circumstances may be. I just want to recognize that you may be eligible for DUA benefits because of that. Uh, and so I just, I, I, that, you know, may not be kind of intuitive for somebody to think about, you know, I can't work because I'm going through all of this emotional circumstances, et cetera. Um, you know, therefore I, I shouldn't file because I'm, I'm not able to work, but we've actually been in conversation with USDOL and with FEMA about this topic. And um, if you, you cannot, get to work because of those circumstances, uh, you may be eligible for benefits. We may have to work with you to make sure we have that properly documented and that may need some sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, support letter or whatever it may be from your primary care provider. But I just, I want to acknowledge because I think that's really important. Uh, there still are supports for you financially um, you know, if, if you are going through that and, and uh, we may be able to assist there. So I appreciate you just letting me jump in real quick because I, I don't think people really make that connection or, or understand that may be the case. So uh, thank you. And, and, you know, thanks for everybody for being here and Susanna, Senator Clarkson, everyone again. Thanks. Thank you to everybody for joining us. I think that's it.
Thanks. Thank you. This was, this was terrific. Thank you. Bye-bye.